great friend. We were talking so many years. We've known each other. 23, I think it is. Or he'll, he'll let me know. Um, he's real busy coming up. He's got a big show in D.C. Opening up for some great comedy stars. He's a star in his own right. Teddy, son of Pearl Robinson. Great to have you here, brother. How are you? Hey, man, I'm fine, man. Thank you for having me. And it's great to be here, brother. Great to yeah. be here. Travel, traveling with guitar? Yeah, man. You know what, what man? You it's, 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 this is my four string. This is kind of like my, my writing base. Oh, wow. Ooh, <laughs> you wow. Know, I usually write on this. And uh, I recently ran into a situation where I felt really bad, man, because I've been writing and not really practicing. Oh, and okay. writing and practicing is two different things. Right. So usually if I write, I may come up with a groove or something, you know. You know, be like, oh, that's great. Practicing is you going do re mi so far, you know, you know, running your runs, running your scales. Right. And so I got into a situation where I was probably thought I was supposed to bring my bass, but I had only been songwriting, so my chops weren't as funk as I would want them to be. Mm -hmm. Or I hadn't written tunes specifically with the bass in mind to be able to go out and, and actually give it the funk that it really needed. So I, I made a note to myself, got to get back to your chops. Got to get that, as my uncle would say, woodshedding. That means that you come right. in an hour right. a day, two hours a day, and all you do is sit in that corner and you practice. You don't come up with a riff and say, oh, that's a song. Because that's usually what happens. Right, right. You know? I hit a riff and be like, mm, them lyrics I wrote yesterday is popping, you know, and there you go. The practice is over now because I'm into the song now. So uh, I got to make that happen, man. But uh, yeah, we're going to we're going to get more bass this year. <laughs> hey, I'm all, I'm all for it. I love love the portrait. I got a friend in Sweden, Anthony Chatelaine, who's a big mm -hmm. funkster and and uh, it had to have the bass or he was kind of, you know, <laughs> turning off the dial. So <laughs> he'll be happy for that. What what yeah. um kind of bass you have right there? For the music, man, you know what, uh, man? Um, I got a pretty decent arsenal now. You you know you can never have enough basses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh, but this is a Gavison. This is a very inexpensive bass. But one thing about basses, I tell anybody, it's about the feel. Mm -hmm. I have picked up a Stanley Clark or Marcus Miller bass, and that's been three or four thousand dollars. And you'd be like, wow. And it didn't feel as good as this for what I'd use it for, you know. Uh, but the Gavaston is very inexpensive. But what I liked about it, it just had that, it gave me that funk feel. You know, it was like kind of like my favorite bass to write on. Um, and of course, I have a Marcus Miller five string. I have a a Diamond Series uh, five string sector. You know, I have a, a Dean Rhapsody eight string, you know, so I, I have decent equipment, but when it comes down to this, that pure funk mm -hmm. is it's pretty good right here. <laughs> there you go. You got a name for the bass? Oh, oh man, I, this is Pearl. This this is Pearl right oh, okay. here. This, this, of course, your mom. The name's yeah. right here, you know. Yeah. Uh, now in the studio, I could be open with you. She's not that great. Because okay. she she's a she's a very inexpensive bass, or so just say cheap. So she has a lot of hum, and you, the engineer he's got to work it out in frequencies, right. and that's because of the pickups. And even if you put some pickups, it's like it just it wasn't built to be that. So mm -hmm. it's usually better live, you know. And speaking so, of live, um, you're real excited. I'm sure you are heading. Is it down to uh, DC or? Yeah, it's down to DC. Down, down to, to DC. DC. So yeah, you're playing yeah. Washington DC this Saturday, right? Yeah, this Saturday, man, at uh, the Penn Social Club, man. We'll be opening up for Orlando Jones. Uh, they got some great comedians on there. You know, Mr. V is on there. We got a uh, very uh, smooth spoken word artist, True Spit. We got uh, another uh, great uh, artist, Nazzy. She's going to be there. Uh, you know, we got, uh, uh, you know, we just got, the, the whole thing is so great, man. I mean, when I, when I think about just being a part of it, you know, let me make sure I got everybody named right, just in case they see the interview, <laughs> you know, because you, yeah. you don't yeah, want to right. be, hey, man, you, you said my name wrong. You know, I would not that they would probably be that person, but be like, dude, you're on the show with me. You don't even know my name. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, man, we got uh, Orlando is the headliner. Right. Uh, we got opening comedian Dennis V. Mm -hmm. We got featured comedian Dallas Brown Jr. We got comic and spoken word artist True Spit. Then you got myself, and then we just had a, a recent, uh, and Nazi, and she's very, I mean, that that vibe is tough. 
You know, I, I love what the artist does for what they do. So I'm just happy to be a part of it, you know. And um, I think the website, pensocialdc.com is where people yeah. can get advanced yeah, tickets. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can get advanced tickets, you know. And because one thing that I like about it is that, you know, it made me feel like it's going to be a real intimate type of thing. You know, people right there, you know. Right. Now, of course, opening up, you know, for a comedy show, I, I feel like, okay. But I feel like this. If you come in there and I set the party off, right. then you're ready to laugh. You know, right, I'm yeah. not going to be telling any jokes, but, you yeah. know. Hey, you know, you get them ready for, for a great night out. And, of course, you're a standout performer. You'll be bringing the funk, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, Teddy, son of Pearl Robinson, is with us. Uh, what's the best uh, website people do, to get all your music right now? You know, we, we're streaming, man, on all 17 major platforms. Because if you go through DistroKid to put your music up, you're going to get all 17 anyway from Deezer and France. All of, you know, you're going you're to get on all our 17 pro, uh, platforms. But for me, mm -hmm. I say for an artist, an independent artist, Bandcamp is best. Bandcamp okay. is best because, uh, like, say, for instance, the, the, the single is only like a dollar, a dollar seven. You got to get more right. than a dollar. They give me 80 cent of that. That's, that's you know, pretty so, good. So, so, yeah. so that's pretty good. When I think about Michael Jackson at one time was only getting $1 out of a $20 CD. And you think, right, but right. Still, so the million copy made a million dollars. So you made $36 million. But still, you think you got $1? Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, just to get 80 cents out of a dollar, you know, it's fine. You know, and, and really, you know, I've heard people say, and they say it all the time, it's business, you know, you know, we as artists, we really don't care about the money, but at the, but in the end, you do care about whether people are going to support you so you can keep doing it, because you can't go on tour if you don't have the money to pay the right. other artists, or whatever, you know, so it does come down to it, but you do want to feel like a company is looking out for you, and Bandcamp does that very well. Yeah, uh, we were at a show out here in Saratoga Springs Saturday night. Our friend Mystic Bowie played, and mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he made a special mention to the crowd. Please be sure to stop back at the merchandise table and pick up some merchandise because touring is not enough. So, I mean, you really have to have, I guess, from, from all avenues to, to make it go, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, we have merch. We, as a matter of fact, we have some new merchandise coming out. Hopefully I will have them before I leave here on Friday, which, you know, I think that I am. And we just have some T-shirts and uh, we have some wristbands, you know, basically. I, mean, I don't know if you can even see see the little crazy wristband here. And it says, uh, oh, yeah, Mellow Funkism. And it says yeah. sonapearl.bandcamp.com. So, you know, because you, what I realize is that when when people are excited about you or you're excited and you tell people who you are, they can, they're excited for that moment. But by the time they get back home and say, honey, who was that guy we met? What was his name that was sitting in, right. the, in the restaurant at, at uh, Texas State Roadhouse and you having a great time and be like, I like that guy, but I can't remember his name. But that band works, you know, and t-shirts and hoodies. We have all those things too. So uh, I'm just happy. I found that uh, Spotify does let you do merch pretty well, but Bandcamp does too. You know, it's a lot, you know, better, you know, so I'm a Bandcamp fan. <laughs> there you go. Hey, independent put, 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 way, put Son of Pearl right on Bandcamp's front page. You, you gave a nice publicity for them right there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, we've known each other for 23 years, you mentioned, and uh, share a lot of the same musical interests and, um, Let's let's go back a little bit for if people are, I mean, a lot of my listeners and viewers know Son of Pearl, of course, but uh, for those just watching this right now, the start of your music passion, um, where did it all begin? You know, man, it all began, man, in a little town. I'm from a little town in Florida called Panama City, Florida. Uh, they say home of the world's most beautiful beaches because the sun is candy white. It is also now home of one of the biggest jazz festivals called the Sea Breeze Jazz Festival. Oh, yeah. Really and yeah. Uh, that happened over the last 20 years because when I really found out about it four or five years ago, I was like, what? That don't say. Yeah. Are you serious? You know, it was like, hey, you know, so, yeah. it's a big thing. so that's one of my bucket list goals to perform on that show if I can ever get there. They would have what they have an up and coming, uh, up and coming stage. Because uh, last year, Sheila E. was there. This year, George Benson was there. The Jacksons were there. You know, just just over and over again, it's been great. But um, I started playing bass 
uh, right after uh, I lost my mom uh, uh, when I was very early in my life. And I'm the oldest of seven kids. So we were uh, pretty much welfare kids. We moved in with my great, great grandmother. Right. So you can imagine uh, two elderly people, a maid and a mm -hmm. yardsman in right. a two bedroom house, one bathroom, wood heater, seven kids. Four girls, three boys. So right from where we live, the projects, Masalina projects, you may hear me sometime refer to myself as the Masalina kid. Yeah, yeah, I saw that in uh, the email you sent me. <laughs> but uh, that project was pretty rough. And so my uncle, uh, Scoop Waters, he was a guitar player. And he basically kept me from being in the streets by teaching me how to play the bass. And the only thing about it too, I was also an athlete. I ran track and I played football. So the day that I came in from football practice and they were doing their thing, right. everything was taken. The drums were taken, the guitar was taken, and my little brother was trying to sing. So the only thing that was left was bass. So I picked up the bass and he taught me from that point on, man. And, and uh, that's really how I began to play. I probably, even through college, I, I, I basically played, but I was, you know, young and dumb and you know the rest of that statement in college right. and um it wasn't until i actually came back for my first extended army i left college after two years you know i was you know playing and uh when i came back i started a band called Masque with my uh now um rest in peace uh partner eric leon jenkins okay. uh that led us to a record deal, a independent record deal with a small level name, small record label named uh, Capson. And uh, we did two singles. I wrote both of the tunes. Uh, we had feature artists, uh, a young lady named Cynthia Calhoun and another lady named Angela Lawson. Cynthia Calhoun went on to be a serious actor. She was in Minister Society. Uh, she also was a hellacious background singer for one of my favorite bands in the world, Steely Dan. Oh, okay. If you yeah. go to any of those old videos live, she's old in the video. So, I mean, excellent artist. So, uh, I really kind of got my feet wet early in her, but not knowing the business kind of was like taken advantage of. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I don't think we still, I mean, I, st I am still credited as the songwriter, but as far as owning the rights to that tune, we don't. Okay. Uh, I was recently signed to a record label out of. Uh, Newcastle, in, uh, UK, six nine records, and so they they picked me up, and we did about two singles, and that was great. And so uh, after that, after being released from that, I wrote Eclecticism. And I think I wrote that in about a week. <laughs> you know, right. I just wrote day and night doing that because I was just so glad to to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do. Uh, six nine is a very um, very good record label, but they specialize in boogie you know, okay. and, and so, and they, in house, and you know me, I want to do everything. If I wake up with Dolly Parton mixed over uh, uh, Kanye mixed over uh, uh, George Benson, then I'm going to, I'm going to do that. It's kind of hard to put you in a place that they can't really find a place for you. You yeah. know, not a lot of so, open-mindedness in some of the circles, I guess. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Well, you do, you're doing great. I mean, I like Thank you, really. My my person, I love the stuff you released with Six Nine Two as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, th this new music you had, you, you sent me a few tracks, and it's smoking. Especially the single. Tell tell us about the single you work with man. Carlos Brickhouse, right? Oh man, yeah, yeah. Carlos Brickhouse, man, is is an excellent guitar player out of uh, Baltimore. He is. I love him, man, because uh, when I grew up, my mom was into jazz, so she listened okay. to Wes Montgomery. George Benson, those type of guys. And I always wanted to be a guitar player, but as you, as I told you, I showed up late. <laughs> you know, so the only instrument that was open was bass. So for me, it was very important that when I started to get back to the basic R&B, there was no way I can hear a tune without music, without a guitar player, you know, because my uncle's a guitar player. And usually his philosophy was, if it didn't groove on four tracks, it's not grooving. So if okay. you listen to that tune, okay. drums, I got two bass lines in there. And that guitar line, there's only really four parts. Four parts of that song. Two bass lines, guitar, and drums. And I just try to make it groove. I just try to cook the groove, you know, like our friend. 
you know, right. Mr. 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 Nelson. Mr. You, Nelson, you, yeah. You, you, you cook it, you cook the groove, yeah. Right. How about how about songwriting? I mean, you know, bass is your top instrument, but you work with all different kinds of instruments. How how do you write? Well, you know, usually, man, I start with a bass line, you okay. know, or sometimes I hum a bass line. And if I hum that line, I'd be like, okay, now I'm automatically thinking chords. You know, I'm automatically hearing lead riff. And that's why even with Five Miles High, by the time you lay that, and you pull the riffs up, you pull the riffs over the top of it, there's nothing really, by the time you go, it's like, mm, smoking, smoking. Right, right. And that's all you need. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm quite sure maybe some other producer, but my producer, uh, Flight Boy Music out of Baltimore, he's been with me for like the last 10, 12 of years. Most of the, um, also all the projects we have is, is with him, except for maybe my other producer, uh, D. Trent Kelly out of uh, Thailand, you know, but Flight's my main producer here in Conus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, once we hit, we was like, do we need anything else? No, we don't. Cause it was smoking. It was just, it just grew to where it's like, bruh, that's tight. You know, yeah. so, you know, and, and the song is really about, I was really laughing cause you know, I released it on 420. So people thought, okay. yeah, 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 that's what he's talking about. No, right. man, what it is, is, is kind of like what you and G got. You're just trying to keep your love high and elevated out of the the, the bull the bull crap of, of every day. Right, you just try right. to get your love so high so that you're above all the strama, which is stress and drama. You, you're above all that. So, you know, you're just keeping your love elevated. That's really what it's about, you know. Yeah. But it'll take you high, 420 regardless, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with 420 because yeah. one day right, when, right. when I leave when I leave the government mule, right. <laughs> I am just a proud civilian. I'm quite sure I would probably find a way to indulge. <laughs> yeah. I, I lost my rights to do that. So, but, you know, <laughs> everybody else, they can do what they want. You know, it's all good. <laughs> cool, hey, cool, listen. Man. Stylish as ever, um, your clothing and, and choice of accessories and, and the paintings behind you. Um, I, lo I love that style right there. Yeah. You know what, I, man? I, I, <laughs> I, thought, I didn't know whether they, they, I didn't know if they were in there or not. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's really nice. Um, you know, yeah. but uh, two of those paintings, uh, two of the ones on the end, I don't know if you can see the ones on the end or not. And, you yeah. know, like oh, now I see it perfect. Yeah. 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 And uh, then this one over here on the over okay. there, those two were did by my homeboy. My His name is Ricky Steele out of Panama City, Florida. He's a great artist. Okay. And uh, I commissioned him to do some paintings because we were just moving into the house, maybe, you know, and he was like, dude, I can do that for you. And he did those. He said, well, music theme. I said, yeah, man, music theme, you know. And uh, the one in the middle I bought years ago for like an anniversary present. You know, we were hanging out one day on the boardwalk and this right. guy was, there. I was like, dude, you did that? He said, yeah. I said, bro, I'm an artist myself. He said, you paint? I said, no, I'm a musician. He said, man, I love it. He started singing. I was like, bro, you blessed me with that. I'm going to bless you. So we bought that, uh, that painting, man, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Right? Nice. You know, I noticed it right away. Of course, the hat. Is that a bowler hat they call? It? <laughs> you know what, man? Uh, they, they call this a, a, a porky pie. I call it pork pie hat, but it's okay. kind of like my go-to hat when I, when I'd be like, dude, I don't know what I'm gonna wear. It's the right. it's the stable go-to hat. Now, come Friday, come a Saturday night, I will have on a more extravagant hat, you know, as a like the hat in the in the in the uh the advertisement that you sent me, the the cover. Oh yeah, yeah, with the X and O on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that yeah. type of thing is more like stage. This I could put on any day and go anywhere, you know. Right. You know, but uh, yeah, man, you know, that's a part of my part of my vibe for real. <laughs> yeah. Teddy's son of Pearl Robinson is joining us right here. And uh, if you're in the D.C. area or willing to travel to D.C., Saturday night is going to be the place. The Penn Social Club, great comedy night. You have a spoken word artist you mentioned as well as okay. yourself. Yeah. Playing mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. So PennSocialDC.com. What, what time? um is the show and doors open? You know offhand. The door, yeah, the doors open at seven thirty, and the show starts at eight. And okay. uh, we 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 pride ourselves uh, uh, in being on time. So I'm sure that when that drops, yeah, uh, Miss Karen is not going to have anything other than lights down at eight o'clock. You know, she she's a uh, man. You know, when you meet people and and they make you feel like 
I got you. Because you know, the business is crazy. The business, yeah. the business is crazy. Everybody calls her calls Mama K. And uh, she is excellent, man. I mean, she has things happening on Tubi. Uh, she has things happening on, you know, on Fox, you know, uh, Hulu. She, she's and but she believes in the artist. She believes in, hey, look, if you got something and I can put you out there to help you, that's right. what I'm going to do. So she, she's excellent, man. You know, I, I love what she's done for me thus far. And I'm looking for bigger things, you know. Yeah, bring some extra scratch to, to purchase the merchandise. Yeah. Teddy Robinson, he'll be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, let, let's go into some of the, the musical taste that uh, we both dig into. Uh, you're a big, big uh, fan, and you mentioned Prince and the Minneapolis music scene. What, as an artist yourself who can play music, you know, make create great music, what drew you and uh, what continues to get you inspired from, you know, Prince and the time and all the guys? ladies man, from the, the Minneapolis scene. It was great, man. I mean, I discovered Prince, man, in the back of a Rolling Stone magazine, the very first album for you. And it was amazing because I couldn't believe here's this guy that plays 17 instruments. Now, of course, you know, when you think about it, the guy was, was brilliant in all aspects. But when you think about, they said 17 instruments, and when you look at the back of it, you see fangle cymbals, yeah. tambourine, right. and you're thinking, okay, well, man, I could probably play about 10 then of that situation. But he was an excellent musician. And what I loved about him was he could take the most normal, simplest groove and make that thing bang. I mean, when you listen to stuff like Hot Thing, you know, we listen to stuff like, uh, uh, fan, uh, 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 oh my God, uh, Hot Thing, Housequake. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorites. Just, which, you know, just the groove is just, uh, uh, you know, right. it's very hard for you, you know, to 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 not move when you hear those tunes, mm. you know. And I just love the, his, the way he put it together. And of course, the lyrics were always so provocative, you know. He was basically saying, I mean, don't get me wrong, Marvin Gaye, some, some great, very sexy songs, you know, like, right. let's get it on, and my, you sure love the ball, but you hadn't heard it the way Prince was doing it. And of yeah. course, when you saw the time, you got the, the ultimate in cool. There's nobody cooler than Mars. I always say, the only man cooler than me is Mars. <laughs> so, you know? Yeah, he would love to hear that. You know, and uh, I, I love the way that Andre Simone always stayed in the pocket. You know, you think about the uh, uh, dirty mind, party up, uh, uh, head, just in the pocket. Because even though somebody can teach you how to play something, you still got to have that feel for it. I teach bass lessons, and sometimes my students are like, "How did you do that?" I'm like, "No, this is how I'm doing. It's very, very simple. I'm going to slap, pluck, and I'm going to slide." And they'll be like, "But it don't sound like." I say it will. It will in time. You know, you just got to practice it. But to be able to play those parts, and of course, you know, all this great work with Jody Wiley, you know, his girls group, you know, I mean, Andre was always hella tough. I mean, I like Brown Mark too, right? you know, but Andre was always be the original bass player for me. Yeah, he was actually the first musician I ever interviewed. I think it was mm -hmm. 1982, 83, when he was mm -hmm. doing his solo work. And, uh, yeah. I was still living at my mom's house and his uh Owen Husney, his manager, called me and said, Oh, are you ready to do the interview? And I said, Uh, I'm I'm at my house, I gotta go to the studio. So I rushed over there and mm -hmm. probably one of my worst interviews. I, I can imagine listening to it now being like a, <laughs> a nervous, like 18-year-old kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But so many well, great well, memories with these guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, uh, I, a lot of my influences are man of those funk groups, you know, Ohio players. You know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know, the KGs, you know, uh, Confunction. I love Confunction. Love, just love Michael Cooper's voice and love the, the bass playing of Cedric. You know, just so many things because I listen to everything. But during that time, too, I was influenced by a lot of rock and roll because my great, great aunt, you know, she passed away last year at 98. Whoa. She was like our local parentis because my great, great grandmother, in fact, they were too old. Yeah, and right. imagine being there that day and having CPS show up right after you come from the funeral. You haven't got to the repast yet. And they wow. were pretty much there with the van. But if she hadn't signed those papers, they would have split us all up. But she 
was just a maid for one of the richest people in their county. Mm -hmm. So what they would do, and you know when you're rich and you can just throw stuff away, she would just yeah. bring home records. They, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine that now. They would buy records and bring them, so she would bring on Humble Pie, Yes, uh, right. uh, uh, Kiss. She would bring home uh, Molly Hatchet, and I would learn those records. Once I learned to play, I would learn, like, that's in the same key as Slide. That's in the same key as Brick House. Oh, different fingering, different, you know, this key, you know, but I would learn those tunes. So I got involved in the rock and roll thing. And uh, before you know it, I'm writing my own tunes based with funk, based with flavor. And by the time I just, uh, discovered Stanley Clark, mm -hmm. Silly Putty, School Days, and then he parlayed that into his vibe with, with uh, George Duke. You know, I was like, that is. I had the jazz, had the funk, had the rock. I just did my own thing. And, and you continue to do it. I, uh, one of the latest songs, we're going to hear a, a taste of it on this interview. I, we'll also be on Mixcloud with the full-length songs if, if people want to check that out. Cool. We'll have all the links and put it on social mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you do a very heavily flavored P-Funk uh, track. <laughs> well, what's the name of that yeah. one again? <laughs> what you know about that funk? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's yeah. a great jam. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that is my opening. Um, I took out all the music and just went with the acapella that for my kind of like my intro to stage. You know. Oh wow! Hey, yeah. hey, what you know about that funk? <laughs> we gonna yeah. kick it like it's so school. So you bump it in your trunk. Tell your mama. Tell your daddy. <laughs> you know. I was just having fun with it, man. You know, because yeah. usually. When something is good, hey man, you heard that? You know, hey man, tell somebody. You know, right, yeah. Hey, this latest, hey man, this is that. So, that's that's kind of like my intro to uh, to to the stage, that thing, Al Capello. But yeah, that's what you know about that funk. Yeah, can you fit the mothership in the club? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? <laughs> I need I need a mellow funkism ship to get that's up there. Yeah, yeah, you need a mellow funkism. <laughs> that'd be yeah. that'd be cool, man. Because people always ask me about that because it's very hard i mean even when you listen to george and the boys on every album there was a kind of ballad on there mm -hmm. you know it was a kind of you know a kind of ballad you know even though they didn't really do hard hard you know like bump and grind ballads but they did and uh i just bought a cd by a boy bernie oh wow bernie, yeah, yeah. And, I, I miss him. He was he was mm -hmm. a great guy. He came. I th I think I told you he came in the studio and played wow. with his keyboards. And yeah, we still keep in contact with Judy Warrell's wife. Yeah, wow. and uh, it was like the they have a whole lot of woo, uh, a world of woo, whatever which it was. But he had an insurance man for the funk on there, and I was yeah, like, yeah. "That's crazy, man! Insurance right. man for the funk." I was like, "Okay, right?" So, you know, so yeah, man. I I. I my influences are just so many, man, just so much. You know, I'm a big Queen fan, you know, big Yes right. fan, and, you know, um, just can't get enough, man. It just it has to come from all places. Yeah, um, I've been learning some a couple of things that slid by me over the years, music-wise. That I uh, First, I wanted to talk about your dad, who, I don't know, either you never told me or I just <laughs> never, your dad play percussion with Sam and Dave, right? Yeah, man. You know, that's yeah. an interesting story too, man, because we, you know, my dad, man, he was a, he was a small guy from Panama City, left Panama City. Panama City is about eight, nine hours away from uh, Miami, you know, probably about 10, because I think if you go from Tallahassee, it's about maybe six, seven hours, eight hours. But he left there kind of under duress situations, as he said, and he got down to Miami and he used to wash dishes because he was, he was, all he did was he graduated high school, right. uh, didn't go off to college, but he did get to Miami. He was a hardworking guy. So right. he used to say he would work at a bakery and then he would work at the club. So he said at the time in Miami, around that time, probably in the early 60s or whatever, it was a big thing. You know, Sam and Dave, Harry Belafonte, all those kind of guys come to this one club. And during an admission, he would get up and play with the band. You know, he was a dishwasher. So he would come from there and get on the, the, the percussions and play. And one night, I guess, the one of either Sam or Dave came back and he was like, yo, you sound pretty good. 
you know. But of course, at that time, he had me and and and, and my mom, and he wasn't going to leave, you know, his steady job and try right. to because you know he was banging on the bongos. But right. but that's, we always we used to call him Bongo Willie. That's what we used to call him. Bongo Willie. <laughs> Well, go, go. Hey, hey why, why not? You got to bring him back for, for an upcoming track, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know what? He would love that. As a matter of fact, uh, Eclecticism, there's a, there's a song in there called Willie Dingo. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, he is that imaginary guy. He used to ride motorcycles okay. really wild. And he was a wild soul. When I say wild, man, this is a longshoreman. This guy's off the chain. So he rode that motorcycle very wild and reckless and got into an accident, had some police friends that didn't care for his wildness. And so after that, you know, he didn't ride anymore, but he was that wild spirit, you know? Right. So that's what Willie Dingo is about. And now he's uh, has a new career as the uh, modern day successor to Tiger Woods, right? Yeah, 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 man. I mean, he's got that there hitting the ball. He's got to be, give you pay by play for, on the Masters. And that's yeah. just a guy, you know, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I, it, this is the same guy, this is the same leather wearing, motorcycle, Harley riding, longshoreman guy playing golf now. Right. It's, yeah. that, that's who he is. That, that's, yeah. him. that's him. Hey, let, let's touch on um, your mom, who obviously, uh, integral part to, to who you are today and, and the name Son of Pearl. T tell us what kind of lady your mom was. Man, you know, she was a, a very hard working lady in a pre-civil rights world in a small town in Florida, a very Southern town, if you know what I mean. And um, she pulled herself up by the bootstraps. She uh, had seven kids. But she used to work at a dry cleaner, man, in the morning. She had to be there at five o'clock in the morning. Wow. And she would work at that dry cleaner. Then she would get a ride, however she could, to what at the time was called the Tom P. Haney uh, uh, Voltec School. And she got a nurse's license, LPN. She worked at, I mean, when she had those kids and worked those two jobs, you know, worked all morning, went yeah. to school all night, still had to come home and take care of her seven kids. Uh, our fathers weren't that great. You know, they, they were who they were. They weren't there. We grew up in the projects pretty much on welfare with our fathers. But during that time, you know, you had a lot of, you know, uh, mama, boyfriend, daddies, and those type of things you grew up in the project with. But we, we were always loved. We were always clean. We were always fed. You know, we never missed out on Christmas until she was gone. You know, we always had great birthdays. You know, she did all this. So uh, were, you, were you a good kid or are you? Yeah, man, you know what, man, being the oldest, I had no choice because okay. uh, I learned real quick, like you didn't really want to row Emma Pearl Robinson. You didn't want to, okay. you didn't want to piss her off <laughs> right. <laughs> because she's working hard for seven people and it's just her. So when she told you to do something, you got it done. Or else you knew the raft <laughs> of Pearl yeah, Robinson. Right. So, um, when I decided to call myself Son of Pearl, which sometimes people have a problem with, not saying they have a problem with, but it's really weird. I've been called a lot of things, man. You know, Son of Pearl, Mother of Pearl, you know. Some people didn't even want to use my name. You know, that's one of the things that I had a contention with, with one of the labels. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you're not going to tell me you don't like my name, yeah. you know, and I'd be on your label, you know, because this is representation of, the reason why I even play music, because the day that my mom met her demise, my stepfather brought us home. So imagine this guy bringing seven kids home after they just found out that day that their mom has gone to a better place. And during that time, man, cassettes were really hot. Mm -hmm. And I had a little red cassette player. And I remember, man, playing the album that Fire was on. And I played that cassette for my sisters and brothers. Because remember, I'm the oldest. Right. So after a while, they kind of didn't really know what was going on. Me and my brother Will, you know, kind of knew what was happening. And my brother Jackie, we kind of knew, hey, man, mom was gone. And so that music was all that I had to really kind of hold us together. You know, we're going to learn this song today. We're going to sing this song today. You know, are you going to sing that part? I'm going to sing this part. So it's very, her name was very important, you know, plus the, at the time when I was really into it, Teddy Riley was hot, Teddy Pendergrass mm -hmm. was hot, 
And I got tired of people confused, but not that I sang that word, that they'd be like, you sound like, no, but when people would come out, people were looking, hey, we're looking for Teddy Riley. No, Teddy Robinson is here. Who is Teddy Robinson? You know, so, right, yeah. you know, so I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? Son of Pearl will work just fine for me. Yeah. And, I know I'm Pearl. not the only son of Pearl. Yeah. yeah. Son of Pearl. Ted, Teddy Robinson, Son of Pearl. And um, Saturday night, going to be uh, opening up for a great night of comedy and spoken word and who, who knows what else, but it's at the Penn Social <laughs> oh, yeah, Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, PennSocialDC.com, right? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Hey, let, let's, um, before we head on out, um, I wanted to ask you about the upcoming plans. You're always thinking of ways to get your music out in different configurations. And, and what, what do you see in the next next couple of months on what you, what you have planned? Well, you know, with the summer coming and the spring and the summer coming, man, I'm looking to really try to hit the festivals. That's why Saturday is so important because it's kind of like the, you know, shake off the the, the cobwebs and, right. you know, come out of the studio. Uh, I remember listening to Steely Dan or reading um, Ad Ball and Steely Dan's Greatest Hits uh, thing a long time ago. And it said how in the beginning they almost gave up touring. After wow. the first couple of years, they just didn't dig it mm-hmm. because it was just, ah. Uh, So what they did was try to be these great studio musicians, but then they realized they still had to go out on the road. But when you got the greatest musicians behind you, something different. Now, for me right now, that's difficult because Palos is probably able to to tour a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you still got to get a drummer, still got to find a keyboard player with all the keys. You still got to teach them all those parts. You still got to practice it. So it's easier for me to go out with tracks. Now, that's not as attractive to some people, you know, which I do understand. So, of course, we're going to, you know, get our chops hot again. Um, we're going to make sure we get our rig a little bit tighter. You know, I've been having my own some Marcus Miller uh, things, you know, uh, the Mark bass that he uses. And so, OK, so you can at least add that aspect to it. But um, we hope to hit the festival circuit really hard this year. You know, and that's 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 the big thing. This year, live performances. And uh, Son of Pearl, Teddy Robinson, go to his Bandcamp page, uh, follow him on Facebook with all the updates. It's hot and heavy right now with some great updates. And of course, buy the music, support an independent musician still grinding out there. And uh, I'm so happy we're still still friends, and, and hopefully we'll stick around. Much longer we'll be we'll be doing this when we're well into our seventies or oh yeah 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 <laughs> like uh, Jimmy so. Blake <laughs> like that's you right yeah that's right. Like, yeah baby you know right, right. <laughs> so uh, go out and see Teddy this uh, Saturday night in D.C. Penn Social Club and you know the best best to your wife and family Teddy hey, Amen thanks again and keep the funk alive right I will brother I will I will. <laughs> All right. Thanks for stopping by Joe Kelly Radio. Thanks, Teddy. Cool. Thanks, bro. What you know about that funk? We gon' kick it like it's old school. So you bump it in your trunk.